Very good, okay. Uh, well, firstly, it's been really good to listen to some of the other presentations. And I'm glad, Joy, I read your letter for the next year's people and it just clicked something. I said, yeah, of course, you've got to come to these other presentations. And actually, I really regretted not coming, uh, not making more time to come to the other ones, but it's been really good to listen to everyone today. So I'm glad I came a bit early. I will now give my final, third and final presentation on my project, which uh, is based in the Snowy Valleys region of New South Wales, towns of Tumut, Batlow and Tumbarumba. And for those who weren't here last time, here's our location map. It's about four and a half hours drive from Sydney. I think probably everyone here has seen at least one of my presentations before. Anyway, so as I will present today, I began my project on a certain trajectory, which was working together with the local council investigating a tourism product, a tourism experience based around small farms and sustainable farms. And my interest in that was that if you can increase the economic prospects for sustainable producers, then you're increasing sustainability more generally. As I will explain in this presentation, I went on a certain trajectory and quickly uncovered that in my best opinion, the idea wasn't really ready to go ahead. It wasn't really a feasible option at this point. And the reason was that the, the honestly legislative foundation in the local government area was set up in such a way as to make it very difficult for producers to do their thing. So there was going to have to be some firstly, uh, research into that to understand what precisely needs to be changed. Secondly, then you need, that's a political process to change legislation. And it was not only local government, it was state government. And it was suddenly becoming a big issue and too much to wrap into the first little bit of a tourism project. So um, I started looking closely into that, including looking at the history of the area and seeing what was, how, how everything had developed, how it uh, has, to the point we're at today, and then looking into some of the ways in which these planning decisions are made. And I went along that trajectory for a little while, about a month ago. I was looking a lot into planning legislation and so forth. And finally, I kept wanting to cite information that I've discovered from my previous research in Europe, Eastern Europe and Russia, which is uh, where I've found the best examples of these uh, small farming developments. And I kept wanting to cite information that wasn't there. So in the end, I decided, okay, I'm going to write this paper, which is a literature review of all of the information which is available on this particular concept, so as that it can be cited in the future. And for the council, I'm going to deliver a short, you could call it a report, but I'm going to, it's more like a letter, really, that's going to explain what's happened and give my recommendations. And of course, I can also send them this paper as well. So anyway, I will now present how it all happened. That was a rough timeline of uh, how this worked out. So the beginning was uh, talking with the local community. That was really fun. That was great. I went to several farms and I talked with the farmers and I talked them through this process of farm gate sales and having events throughout the year to get people down from the cities and everything. And it was really great. But I did keep coming across, oh, the council won't let me do this, or this costs so much to do, or the zoning's wrong, so I can't do that. And I had to hire a consultant and it cost me so much money in order to get this through and all of that kind of stuff. So that's when, like I said, I went towards the planning reform and uh, then finally found that uh, I needed to do even a little bit more foundational work before I could really get stuck into that. So I saw this as a, as a, as a uh, I was laying foundations for achieving the same aims I set out to achieve, but realizing that it was a much longer process than was going to be possible in these three months. So starting from the beginning and just doing this properly, and then who knows, maybe in the future I'll be able to reach the similar aims that I set out with originally. So in terms of the outcomes, like I've already mentioned, the first is a short thing for council. And, uh, I found it really interesting. I loved doing this project and I thought that the, uh, the outcomes themselves were 
pretty interesting. Um, the council does have a role to play uh, legislatively, mostly, unfortunately, that's a state government issue, which is a much larger thing. And uh, mostly what I found that they could do is help local people by communication networks. So they have employees that do social media and publicity and PR, and all they need to do is send an email address or a telephone number that a producer can pick up a phone and say, hi, I've got an event here, you've got my you know, file photo on file, can you just put a post together here, the details, so forth, that kind of thing. Um, so that's the kind of uh, recommendations that I've put together for the council, and I will send that off, and I think those are easily implementable and could easily and would be good to go ahead soon. Uh, like I mentioned briefly, one of the key findings that I will mention to council is this issue here, and this quickly blew out to many different issues, and it was the zoning problems, that the zoning doesn't let people do the kind of things that they wanted to do in their land in order to be sustainable. It was the uh, regulations in terms of covenants on pieces of land. So, for example, on my own land title in this LGA, there was a covenant that said that we had to plant our own vegetative barrier to protect our land from the spray drift coming from industrial agriculture down the valley. And when I first read that, I thought, okay, fair enough, you know, makes sense, I don't want spray drift on my land. But it started happening a few times that we were experiencing spray drift, and I was thinking about this more, I didn't really like it, and I talked to the EPA on the phone, and then looked up the Pesticides Act, and turned out that it's illegal to let spray drift onto other people's land, in so far as it causes damage to their property. Uh, so I found it curious, well, disappointing, honestly, that the council had put into their conditions of development something that essentially was aiming to legitimise something which is equally illegal under the law. Uh, and it was one of a list of examples where I thought that the underlying um, legislation, so there's a covenant on a land title, which is a difficult thing to change, and there's the Pesticides Act, which is state law, um, and a lot of this stuff comes through in the land zoning, the uses of the land zones, which is in what's called the standard instrument, which is technically speaking local government laws, but are set by the state government. So it suddenly became, it snowballed into many different things that needed to be changed. Um, this is one of the things in terms of subdivision that I wanted to point out. So I had to make this map, and this is one of my great interests. This is Cadaster which is the lots of land as they're set out. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the town of Batlow. That's our land there. And these are lots around us. The first thing that jumps to mind to me is equity, for example. You know, some people have massive pieces of land and some people have tiny pieces of land. The other thing you might think is that the, does the, how's the topography, you know, is the best land where this town is and this not so good land is the converse. Actually, this is the best land where it's all flat and good water and watercourses, and this is all nestled up against the hill in a bit of a forest, and that's quite a steep hill through here where many of the people live. So I looked into the history of the town, basically found out that uh, it was developed by about 10 large landowning families who lived like here, 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 and then some on the other side who came mostly from the UK, mostly with a lot of capital, and set up commercial orchards, and this was essentially the dormitory for their workers. So, in my view, to achieve an image of sustainable small farms flourishing on the land, there needs to be a big change in how that works. So, in other words, there needs to be a distribution of people onto dividing up some of these pieces of land so that they can actually create the kind of small farms that the council wants to market. So they were all up on the marketing and they loved my photos and they wanted to do social media stuff and everything. But I looked at this and I said to myself, that's not going to work. <laughs> so how do we move forward from there? Here is my academic paper in its not quite fully finished form, but that's my um, abstract there. So family homesteads, this is an issue that I wanted to lock down academically, as in to put a proper definition, put a proper literature review onto to show how other academics have interpreted 
the situation. It's basically, and I'll run you through as quickly as I can, but I have so much to say today <laughs> that I've got to keep racing through. Um, but I'll run you through my, my article. So basically... So uh, we've still got 10 minutes. Great. <laughs> well, I'm going to number three, so <laughs> I better keep going fast. Anyway, um, so the family homestead concept was developed in Russia, quickly spread to Eastern Europe, the basic idea is that any person gets one hectare of land on which to live. It's a form of human right. It's, a, it's instead of welfare, and it uh, happens for free, and the land itself is not to be bought or sold. So it's not a piece of real estate. It's a form of birthright or uh, like a social contract with the state that you get a piece of land, but then you need to develop it and look after it yourself. Um, and I posed this as to say, by saying that the current development strategy of our local area in our state are all about big industry and all about uh, technology. And those two things aren't sustainable. And we know that. So let's look at this which is sustainable. So here are some stats on the situation now. So uh, the first ones started to be built in the early 2000s. There are now estimated, this estimated by me, judging by information collated there, 450 settlements, more than 30,000 residents, and 500,000 plus who are interested, and that can be gleaned because there's a political party that has membership. There's a system, a federal system of allocating land in Russia which attracted 124,000 applications in its first year of operation, which was this year. Um, and there's a federal law of the Russian Federation wanting to spread the idea to the entire country, which is currently being pushed by Medvedev, who's second in command of the country, uh, in order for another vote to be held on that soon. So, in other words, it's a significant social phenomenon, and there's practically no study of it in English at all, uh, so I did a literature review. I did 71 papers. Uh, 67 of those were in Russian, which I read. <laughs> um, one of them was, oh, two were in German, one was in Czech, and one was in Ukrainian. Um, and from this broad picture of this movement, I classified, I categorized them into how they, how they saw the movement. So. What I've got up here, most of the people saw it as, as an environmentalist movement, similar to the eco-village movement in the West, although, in my opinion, that's not exactly right, and some other academics agreed with me that it does have differences. Um, the second most people talked about it as a, an economic idea, and they emphasised the fact that this reduces costs for the state and also increases the business activity and self-sufficiency of the family, uh, some people talked about it in terms of international sustainable development goals. There was a what I called a significant minority, so it was a small number, but it was a significant number of religious scholars who talked about this as a new religious movement. Personally, I disagreed with their interpretation of that, so did other, some other academics, but they were interested that some of the communities they'd studied were drawing on the old sort of pre-Christian beliefs in Russia, and they were then studying it through that lens. Some people talked about agricultural innovations as well that were happening. I argue in my paper that this kind of development is perfectly suited to the Snowy Valleys basically because of its geographic conditions and the fact that there are plenty of people who could use work and these things employ people. So this is, this is the Australia map. Um, Basically, the important bit about this is the orange. This is our LGA here and here, and that low where I live is there. Um, the orange is the grazing land, and that is the biggest potential for this kind of development. The brown is the orchard land, which is proven to be able to grow high water requirement trees, and you can see the close proximity of this, which is essentially vacant land, that's beef grazing, which is, and I have included studies that show, a low-value agricultural pursuit 
compared to the kind of mixed, dense, small farming that we're talking about. Um, this was a comparison that I want to draw with the previous cadastral map. So this is a cadastral map drawn up by settlements of family homesteads in Russia. The obvious thing that jumps to mind straight away is that each of these are equally sized, giving a certain level of equity, and they're also large enough, each one of those is more than one hectare, they're large enough to pose as a collective a significant agricultural unit that is effectively divided in responsibility that you do not need excessive inputs of fertilizer or fuel or machinery to collectively farm that entire area. So the consequences of uh, the concept to me are profound, which is why I choose to study this. This is, this is the thing to me that is the foundation that can help uh, achieve the goals that my project first set out, but also more broadly we're all talking about in terms of sustainability. Uh, I've listed some of my papers, some of the papers that I've studied, uh, under the different social, environmental and economic uh, um, goals. What I would probably point out as the most important, since I need to keep racing along here, is this one. Now, Kolganov is from the uh, MSU, which is Moscow State University, which is the biggest and oldest university in Russia. And he's great. He's an economics professor. And he, he has a very sanguine view of this movement. Uh, he says, look, people inside the movement say... 50% of Russia is going to be like this. It's going to spread all around the world. Everyone's going to do this. I'm not so sure. But if even 10% of the country were to do this, we would see an immediate cost saving in terms of infrastructure and welfare, and we would see immediate environmental improvement. So he, to me, was probably the weightiest academic who stepped in and said, let's give it a go. I see some potential in this one. These are some photos from things. So this is... This is a um, self-maintenance of roads without machinery. This is employing the unemployed of the village, of, of, of rural villages, in order to plant trees. That's produce. And this is um, water. <laughs> um, all right. So the contribution, I split into two parts, I think. No, uh, yeah. The, so the, for the workplace, I've given them a little bit of a roadmap to say, okay, if we want to do this, this is some of the things we've got to think about. Um, the contribution is for, of the literature review, I'm hoping, is that it's going to be some good academic sources on what, to me, is a significant social phenomenon and can be something that people can refer to later in order to study it more. In terms of my planning, I've outlined a little bit before I really started how it kind of went off in one trajectory and then another one. Um, I think I more or less did stay honest to the goal, but obviously I uncovered some missing elements that I wanted to do first. So, um, so I've gone back and laid that groundwork that I hope can still achieve the aims later on. Um, I want to show that one in terms of uh, sustainability. That's a word cloud I did. I don't know if, if you guys did intro to sustainability. We had that I know it when I see it thing. So I made this word cloud that's an updated thing, 10, top 10 Google hits. That's what people think of sustainability. I, I love the fact that environment's the biggest one, right? And economy is underneath environment and social is underneath that. Um, and in my very first essay about what is sustainability, I took the radical view that it actually has a meaning already that is defined in the dictionary and comes from its etymological roots, which are to support from underneath and to extend. Sustainability is about surviving through time. And I began sustainability course thinking that, and the more I continue, the more I think it's true, that if we stay... Uh, loyal to this definition, then everything else falls into place. Because you can say sustainable economic growth, that's great, but the GFC happened. So that was not sustainable. So if we actually talk about something that's going to endure and last for a long time, 
then we will find what we're looking for in terms of sustainability. Um, well, I guess this is my last slide, so I've done pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so the reflections on learning, I deliberately left this one blank because um, <laughs> we, we did a, well I've done my reflection in preparation, but uh, yeah, well we did, a, we did a course in Lao with Georgie was there as well and we didn't have PowerPoint presentations to do our, our uh, individual group tasks and I loved it, it was so good because it was just sitting there and you had to memorise everything and you had to just animate the room with yourself, I love that kind of thing. And the real big takeaway for me is that from this project, that personally I have to do something that really inspires me from the beginning. I think I got a bit wowed by the workplace and suddenly I was in their office and I was being treated well and invited, oh you can sit here at the desk and all of this kind of thing. And it was all pretty cool at the beginning, but I sort of lost enthusiasm as I found that their vision for sustainability was just not that bold at all and in fact that it, it, there was a lot of dysfunction in the organisation and overall like, I'm really glad that finally I found something I was really passionate about and I was able to do a lot of work uh, in order to pull together what I think is a valuable uh, product at the end of it and I'm hoping will still provide something useful to the council as well down the line. So there we are. Thank you. Thank you very much. And here are my abridged references. <laughs> <laughs> but the ones that I referenced in the PowerPoint, anyway, so. Malika. I think it was really good. I hadn't attended any of your presentations so far. So very interesting. Um, I like what you said about like um, what you think about sustainability and I just wanted to ask you, you said it's about surviving through time. Um, I think that's good and I, yeah. like, I don't mean to contest your opinion on sustainability because I think Please everyone do. has their own. But I was thinking that when you say that, I feel that one house, one group survives can actually put say another group or another community at danger of like not surviving through that mm -hmm. particular time. So mm -hmm. when you say survive through time, what does that mean? Is that universal or like That's absolutely a fantastic point. Um I cringed a little bit at the word survive because I I know I said it, but maybe I thought of enduring or just continuation. Um so this is the little thing that I came here, this little definition. Okay. And the key word there for your point, would be in coherent form. So, okay, is that sustainable if 95% of the population dies in a, ca in a cataclysm? To me, no, because that's not, a, that's not a coherent form. There's been a massive juncture. That it, it's, it's about maintaining what we have, and I really have a vision that does not involve the population of the Earth. Like, it's really that we're going to peter out at 10 or 11 billion, and we're going to stay there, that's the aim, okay? And we're still going to recognise us today as part of our culture. We are part of that and see a, a, a coherent or continuous strand of culture without any of these big breaks. And to me, I absolutely agree with you. It's not about survival of factions and not to want to sound too woo-woo, but it is about a, a global community, a global family of people, and, uh, and maintaining that. Like, I think that concept of equity becomes quite important in sustainability. Yeah. Um, how, how the big question that I can imagine being asked is, where is that hectare of land that it comes from? If pretty much all of Australia is currently owned, owned by somebody, absolutely. What's your thinking, or what did you find in the research that worked in Russia? Like, was it unused land, or was it land that someone donated to the cause, or <sighs> yeah, requisition? Not requisition. It's not popular anymore, anywhere. <laughs> um, leaving the the other two options. So of the existing examples, 
Russia and Eastern Europe are well placed. Why? Because half their land is owned by the state and is fertile. Whereas, great, 50% of New South Wales is crown land, but it ain't to this kind of thing. It's, um, yeah, it's this arid, arid grazing land. Uh, so, yeah, the ones in Russia came from uh, mostly unused collective farms. So at the end of the Soviet Union, a lot of the big farms stopped functioning. So they've now had 20 years of growth, regrowth, more than 20 years, almost 30 years now of regrowth. Um, and it was as simple as going to your local government, and I mean local government, and saying, hello, I would like 200 hectares of land on which to create a settlement. And the local government would say, just let me look at what we have available and then come back to you with a series of proposals. So that's one of the reasons why it's been so much easier to do in Russia. The way I imagine that was not really the scope of my paper at this point, but to answer your question, the way that I would imagine such a thing happening in Australia would firstly be through the second option, which is donation. And practically speaking, what that means is giving people in Australia the option to subdivide subject to certain conditions. So it's not subdivide to build houses two metres from one another all made of brick and concrete and blah, 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 and sell. It's under strict conditions that would have to be, in my view, its own act in New South Wales Parliament. You can, and therefore a land zone with all, many conditions, covenants on can't buy and sell, this kind of limit on house size, minimum one hectare, a, a lane, public laneway that you have to maintain around the hectare that anybody can pass through, all of that kind of stuff. Um, just open the door. It was exactly what Malika said in her thing, and I love that slide, because it said, create the path. It's not about changing people, it's just about making a path. And it drives me nuts in this like eco-village movement and eco-movements and stuff. They're all about like, you know, learn how to build a house for $200, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, okay, that's great, but it's illegal. So it's not a path. So I can't follow that path. So when you start looking at the laws, I'm really determined in the future to start looking at how to create a legislative path that will at least open the door to sustainable development. Even before we start trying to push people down the path, let's just open the door and say, look, you know about BASICs, right? Mm -hmm. BASICs, state government planning program where you need to have energy efficiency for new houses. In BASICs, if you go this sustainable, then you pass. If you go this sustainable, you don't pass. If you go this sustainable, then you have to pay an extra $500. That kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know? They, they need to change the incentive mechanisms. They need to have an easier pathway if you want to do some of these more sustainable things, have it cheaper, quicker, easier, etc., just open the door and people will start to go down it. People with land will say, oh, sure, I'll subdivide that land. And then other people will learn from that experience and say, okay, that didn't work, this worked, blah, blah, blah. You know? And then once we've got a bit more experience, then we can start talking about, okay, maybe the government will invest $300,000 into this. You can buy a pretty good piece of land in some places for that, Tasmania, for example. You know, or a million dollars, you buy an excellent piece of land for that. You know? And if they're able to value capture, so they buy it before it's subdivided and then they subdivide it, they can get super good deals on this kind of thing. They could even make money off it. You know? Not that that should be the aim, but they could. So there, there are different models for how it will work. I'm definitely not in favour of requisitioning. And you do need to be careful as soon as you mention Russia, they say, oh, God, you're not really. You know, one thing that might be interesting to have a look at in your research, and I'm mm. not an expert at all, but I'm pretty sure after World War II, Mm -hmm. the government gifted land to return to itself on the condition that they cleared it. Oh, yeah. It's obviously not very much uh, in South Australia and WA, so there must be some research on... The first one in the country yeah. was in my region, okay. not 10 kilometres from my house. Wow. It was after the First World War, yeah. and it was called Kanama, and it was a soldier settlement. And it was a spectacular failure. 95% did not last more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. And... The main reason cited was that they had debt, that they were expected from day one to make monthly repayments 
on the proposed value of the, that land. See, I think in WA and SA, the, the only condition mm -hmm. was that you had to have served in the war and you had to yeah. clear the land. Yeah. So the government used it as a way of turning all this yeah, you yeah. Know, unproductive big forest yeah. into productive agriculture. Land. I'm yeah. just thinking if, if you want to find some Australian examples, you could probably research around what that settlement kind of structure was because that might give you some insights into what the government did or didn't do or what mm -hmm. people did. I mean, they're insights, but they're also quite damning, damaging insights that... Don't really support the cause. No, but I'm, I'm just saying you might. <laughs> but there are lessons something. to be learned. You might, you might yeah. something Certainly. Because the government has done it before. People are just pushing back. I know. The same concept. I know. No, no, there's definitely. And there's a fantastic history of my area that talks about that at length with interviews with people, photos. There are still some of the original houses standing that the government yeah. built for people and stuff. Yeah, it's really interesting. There's plenty of stuff. Um, they had no way to sell their produce and they had to make repayments. That was just the clincher. They had, well, where do I make this money to make my repayment? Because I need to, people having to walk nine miles over marshes in order to get their cabbages to market and stuff. It's terrible. So, yeah. But what would be expected to sell? Like, was, was there no plan to them? They would just build, build, grow stuff and then yeah. find the market. Yeah, free market. That's it. That's how so we roll. Yeah, these are people who had enough. So, I think the government's mm -hmm. intent yeah. was that they had some that sort of so needed, like, yeah. Campbell was saying, it's just Pass that was going to work there, but in other places it's been stable. It's just it's just got the little tree. Yeah. It hasn't been carefully grown into that. It hasn't. Well, it's WA and the wheat belt basically, WA and South Australia. And that's pretty much the only way that's got the other Kangaroo Island. Yeah. Who was it successful for though? I think you'll find that there was other electricity on this about getting public funds spent on. Huh. Um, can I ask you this one question? Um, do you have a champion in council for when you present this? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I have, a I have a workplace mentor. <laughs> yeah. And that workplace mentor is still on side and still with you. Yeah, yeah, he's with me. He's with me. I haven't, I haven't showed him the full fruit of my work because no, that's just... Yeah, yep. yep. Yeah. Um, as for an actual presentation to the council, such a thing hasn't been organised between us. What we had envisaged was a report. So I will certainly yeah present that to him, and that should be good. Yeah. And did you do a presentation like similar to this council with more time? It hasn't been organised, but it would be great. Yeah, I, I will. Would you work with you? Okay. Happily suggested. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, you know, my LGA. Like, it's I've never thought of it until my neighbour told me that there are eight councillor positions, right, and nine people ran for them. I thought, oh my god, <laughs> to be a councillor, great. Yeah. Yeah. Try from inside. Well, yeah, we've got to win over. We've got to get votes to do that. So, you could be plenty of work to do. Everybody in the neighbourhood, oh, introduce cool. yourself, and all those interviews. They know what you stand for. Yeah. But you can probably look at who you're competing against. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. thanks for the encouragement. Thank you. Anyone else? Any more questions? Thank you. Um, in terms of the report to council, which you said would be a good report for me. Have you thought about some kind of more tangible next steps for them, considering that your project has been quite large and conceptual and needing quite a high level of systemic and legislative change? Absolutely, very good point. Because um, I feel like this like has been quite overwhelming. <laughs> if, you, if you were just like someone trying to do their job. <laughs> trying to do their job, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so I would direct I would direct you to these recommendations, which are designed to be quick, implementable, really simple. Okay, so yeah. the first is they need a phone number on their website that a farmer who does not have Facebook can call and say, "Can you make a Facebook post for my open day next week?" And they'll say, "Yep." Have you got a photo? The council will send someone out to take a photo or get a volunteer to go and take a photo on an iPhone or something and get that to happen. Second one, there's Tumut Farmers Market about to be starting up and everyone's talking about funding models. How's that going to work? And I say, okay, these people have a basket full of 
you know, lettuce and tomatoes, if you whack them with 50 bucks to get a stall, it's too, it's too much. So how about you just cover the, the insurance and you tell everyone in the, um, in the LGA, look, we're covering this farmer's market, so everyone's paying for it. It costs you very little, but let's go and use it because it's a public good, just like they pay for the swimming pools, which they do at huge expense. So let's pay for the farmer's market too, simple. Um, the third one is a bit more difficult, but that would be at one position. So they just need to give a job to someone who they already employ in council. Say, hey, can you go to Woolies with your council hat on and say, hi, Woolies, are you interested in buying from our local project producers? And Woolies will be like, rah, 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 rah. And then they say, okay, no worries, I'll come back next week, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they can build up a relationship whereby council can basically just spearhead with, because they already, already the most articulate people in the Shire work for the council, all right, except for a few people. <laughs> I'm barely even in the Shire. Um, just, we don't have a house yet. <laughs> Legal residence yet. But, um, uh, and other people work for the big companies. But, um, you know, to use that, those resources, basically. Um, and the fourth one was this, like, very, you know, difficult, oh, I won't think about that quite yet, you know, which is that let's think about a review into the zoning and permitted use. So that's going to be hire a consultant, like, hi, um, to go through and uh, look at, you know, you have an RU3 zoning here and the user would like to have a visitor accommodation. So would you consider adding visitor accommodation to their permitted uses? That kind of thing, just to itemize. That stuff is literally too difficult for a lot of the farmers and is also, unfortunately, too difficult for the planners in the actual council. So they probably need to hire a go-between to connect those together so they just know which amendments to pass with the gavel and make it all happen. So that's my list of bite-sized recommendations that I'm hoping will be doable. How are um, like, uh, Are you expecting them to follow through most of these? Because they seem pretty doable. Like. Expectations. Um, number one is really achievable. They, will, they should definitely do number one. Um, they might not if I just dump this on a desk, but if I follow it through a little bit, they should do it, it's really easy. And they'll probably love it. It's really win-win, it's all that great stuff. Um, number two already is a little bit difficult for them because that's more paperwork, insurance, liability, extra expense, that kind of stuff is getting a bit difficult. Perhaps we'll leave it there, you know? One, I'd say number one we'll get. <laughs> You know, you're trying to convince someone to do something, you present the most difficult one, you know they're going to say no. Okay, that's a great idea. Then present the one you actually want them to say yes to, which is still tough, but easier than the first one. Yeah, great. So just maybe think about how you're going to, yeah, you have to be smart, but you can't put the easiest one first. Okay, thank you. That's very good advice, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm back to the talk about great great community in uh, what I was uh, using on this uh, thinking about the uh, homesteading thing that the mm -hmm. said. It's very similar to some of the uh, way the Pacific Islands constitution structures land, land ownership, traditional land ownership there, mm -hmm. which is uh, tied to the birthright and uh, non transferable. It's quite sophisticated work about how you can then somewhat rely on the complex of land over land and that we are not going to be considered to have a whole range of mechanisms around leasing so that it can be consolidated, it can be consolidated, and be right to extinguish a certain Cool, never heard of it. Sounds great. Okay, all right, well done. Thank you very much. Yep, that was really fun.